My name is Kristen Thompson, and I'm the Education Director for the Future of Music Coalition. I'm also a musician and an entrepreneur. This presentation was originally given at Ignite Philly in June 2008, but I updated it in January 2009 to recognize some exciting changes in this field. It's about how you and I and people around the world will enjoy music in the future. It's about music on demand. Throughout the 1990s, I played guitar in the band Tsunami and co-ran an independent record label called Simple Machines with my friend Jenny Toomey. We released over 75 records in eight years. We stopped putting out records in 1998, but most of the back catalog lives on online. If you're at all like me, you've gathered a lot of music in your lifetime. I've got hundreds of CDs, LPs, and mixtapes. I have a steamer trunk full of 7-inch records, gathered through years of mail-order purchases and record shop browsing. I love my music, but carting it from one group house to the next for the past 20 years has been pretty tiring. So when we moved into our current house, I never unpacked any of it. It's all in boxes, neatly alphabetized. It's not like I stopped listening to music, so what do you think my solution has been? Did I digitize my entire collection? No, I don't have the time or the patience, let alone the hard drive space. Did I jump on peer-to-peer -peer networks and rebuild it? No, current P2P models don't compensate creators for their work, so I'm not going to use them. Did I just rebuy it all? Okay, I'll admit I've repurchased a few albums on iTunes or eMusic because it was easier to do that than to dig through the boxes in the basement, but this is hardly an affordable solution. The primary answer is that now I simply pay for access to music. I have a subscription to Rhapsody, an online streaming service that gives me instantaneous access to over 20 million tracks for $12.99 a month. So if I can think of an artist or an album, I type it in the search bar and I'm listening to it in a matter of seconds, either the whole album or specific tracks. I can also make playlists, listen to related artists, even plug 10 band names in, and Rhapsody will build a customized radio station around that artist. But that's not the only way I access music. There's also countless webcasts to choose from, streams from terrestrial stations like KEXP or WXPN, or online-only stations like Counterstream Radio. And even better, songwriters, publishers, performers, and record labels each earn performance royalties when their music is streamed. Then there's new services like Pandora, Slacker, and Last.fm that foster music discovery. Pandora builds a streaming radio station based on your music preferences. Slacker offers hundreds of preset channels or helps you build personalized streams. Last.fm includes social networking and song wrecking components. And all of these also pay performance royalties. Now you might find it weird for someone who spent nearly 10 years manufacturing and selling CDs and records to say this, but I think music lovers have to stop thinking that owning music is the only way to guarantee that you have the ability to enjoy it in the future. I'm not saying that you shouldn't enjoy collecting music. There's still plenty of fantastic music that's only available in physical format or beautifully packaged sets that are a pleasure to own. I'm just saying that the need to have a physical inventory of everything you've ever wanted to listen to is now unnecessary. These new streaming business models aren't without criticism. First, some people, including Steve Jobs, say these services are the equivalent of, quote, renting music. Since we're a culture that places a high value on ownership and its associated rights, this terminology tends to resonate with people in a negative way. I find the use of the phrase renting music to be disingenuous. Many of us pay monthly fees to cable TV, Netflix, and the internet itself. These are fees we pay to, quote, access content in lieu of outright ownership. Why not music? The second common criticism is, but I'll lose my music if I stop paying my bill. True, but if you stop paying your Comcast bill, you'd lose access to all the cable channels. Not paying your bill doesn't mean the TV shows or the music has vanished. Just resubscribe and it's all there. The third criticism is that subscription services and webcasting stations only work if I'm sitting at my computer. In other words, they're not portable and they're incompatible with iPods. In an environment where consumers enjoy taking their music on the go, this is a crucial point. Two remedies. Rhapsody, Napster, and Slacker have wireless players that you can fill up with streamed music and take it with you. Even better, when you resync your Rhapsody player with your home computer, it recognizes what songs you played while you were on the treadmill and compensates the musicians accordingly. 
Not even iPods do that. A second remedy? MP3 players and phones continue to open up to competing platforms and services. While the ubiquitous iPod is designed to work best within the walled music garden created by Apple, things are changing on the mobile phone front. Pandora, Slacker, Last.fm, and many webcast and terrestrial stations are now available via streaming apps made for iPhones, Blackberries, and Google's Android platform. Continued development and adoption of these streaming apps will greatly improve choices for music fans. And these problems with compatibility will continue to fade as more devices are developed that allow us to access internet-based services everywhere, including in our cars. As these devices roll out, and as WiMAX and G3 coverage increases, the value of actual content ownership will continue to fade. There are many ways that music fans can tap into well-organized, well-curated music services that also compensate musicians when their music is played. I see a future where the value of access to music overtakes the value of ownership. Embrace this future of music on demand.